There's a pretty one, Ulysses. Hello Booktube, I'm Sean Breeze Books. Welcome back to my channel and another Friday Reads, and I'm in a good mood this week. I don't have any special personal news, really, of any kind, other than go Kamala. What a great debate. She put the orange monster through his paces, and it was a joy to watch. So uh, that's been probably my primary preoccupation this week, aside from a rather fabulous week of reading. So let's get right to it. Here is this week's really interesting mystery guest. And this week's Mr. Guest is a writer that I had never heard of, and boy, I'm sure glad to have heard of her now, because she sounds fascinating in her new novel. Sounds right up my alley. Please welcome uh, Nina Burkout, joining us from Ottawa. Hello, Nina. Hi, Sean. Thanks so much for having me. I don't know where I've been that I haven't heard about you. You, This is your fourth novel, and you've got a bunch of poetry collections out there, and yeah. you're all over YouTube. So <laughs> nice to meet you. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's it's great to be here. I'm looking forward to our chat. Let's see. The publication date was September 3rd. So about nine days ago, your fourth novel yes. came out. And boy, does it sound like a Sean book. It's called This Bright Dust. And look at that picture. Of, yes, it's a, it's a William Kurelik painting. He was a oh. Ukrainian um, Nice. Uh, Alberta descent, and uh, he well known for some of his his it his pretty paintings. Yes, his his family uh, actually lost their farm during the depression. They had a farm oh. in Alberta, which they lost around the same time period that the story takes place in. So, so that's a great segue. So, tell us about this bright dust. What a fabulous title! Mm -hmm. And tell us about it. Sure. So it's a it's a historical fiction novel, and uh, it takes place in 1939. So just uh, toward the end of the Great Depression and just before the the onset of the Second World War, it tells the story of uh, the last remaining residents, really, of a of a drought stricken prairie farming community that's situated along a railway line. And it's told from the perspective of a young farmer named Abel Dodds. And Abel is trying to make ends meet and to survive really after about a decade of dust and drought and many, many struggles. He's living on his farm in basically unlivable conditions, really, but he doesn't want to give up. And the story opens when he turns on the radio and he hears news about the royal tour. He learns that uh -huh. the king, yes, <laughs> Abel learns that the king and queen of England, along with the prime minister of Canada, will be crossing the country by train on a goodwill tour. And when he hears this, he's furious and he's uh, you know, disgusted that such a like a spectacle and something so costly to the country would be occurring when especially out West, he and all the people that he's loved and who live near him um, have been suffering for, you know, close to a decade. His only remaining neighbor and also his former classmate, her name is Una Wishart. She lives right next to Abel's farm. She lives with her young son, Toby, and her grandfather. And she feels very differently about this royal tour. And when she learns about it, she wants to welcome the king and queen in case they end up stopping in Grayley, which is their decommissioned town. So as Abel and Una and the families sort of struggle through the winter, the difficult winter and the growing season, and as the radio and news reports of this tour become more prominent and more featured in the headlines, tensions begin to really rise between the two families. Abel feels that some sort of confrontation should take place if the train does pass through. And Una feels that it will change everyone's life for the better if it does, if they do pass through. So that's that is the essence, I suppose, of the plot. Um, that's the storyline. I'll, I'll leave it there. But really, I think more than that, the heart of the novel, it is a story about a small group of really willful individuals, a tight-knit community who are 
doing everything they can to hold on to the the way of life that they so love and the only life really that they have ever known on their farms. Uh, so that I think is more the, the, the essence of the story. So you've, it's not just about the king and queen, although it is in part based on the 1939 royal tour when King George and Queen Elizabeth did pass through Canada for almost five weeks. It was the first time in history that a reigning British monarch came to Canada for a visit. So it was quite significant. It, it absolutely was. And so I'm a bit of a royalty buff. I don't usually describe myself as a monarchist, but I'm not an anti-monarchist. I'm rather the politics of it. I'm yes. somewhat agnostic on, but I'm just a big fan of them in terms of their, I'm so fascinated by them and always have been. So yeah, the 1939 Royal Tour, my, two of my aunts were, well, my one aunt would have been a, a teenager and she kept a scrapbook of the entire Royal Tour, which I have. So every Incredible. clipping in the, in the Saskatoon newspaper or wherever, whatever newspaper, she put it in a scrapbook and I've got that. It's oh pretty my yellow goodness. page now, yeah. And, oh, that's uh, incredible. Yeah. And the, I just recently watched a clip of when they stopped in Saskatoon, and there's some just footage of it that's in color that's wonderful to look at. I'll put a link in the show notes in case people want to check it out. It's not maybe 10 minutes or 15 minutes long, but it's not a it's not crafted into anything. It's just raw footage and it's fabulous. So now that's... um what on earth gave you the idea for such a story Nina? Well I'm originally from Alberta so for me the prairies are home and always will be uh, even though I've been gone for half my life now. I left out west, came out east, went back out west but lived in Manitoba for some years and then ended up back out east for work. I always end up writing about the prairie landscape and the Rockies. For some reason I keep returning to it even though I've been gone for a while. So with this story, it was during COVID and I was working on something else entirely, which I think you've heard this probably from many writers, their projects kind of flopped. It was very difficult to, <laughs> I guess, focus. And what I was working on was taking place in the present day and it just, it didn't work. And so I decided that I wanted to go back in time. I'd never done that before. I've never written anything, any historical fiction. And I thought, well, I also wanted to go home and I couldn't get home during the pandemic, like many people. So it was a way for me to get back out West, get to the prairies and sort of inhabit them in my imagination. I also felt that a lot of what we hear about the Great Depression and the stories, documentation comes from the States. There's a little bit uh, from Canada, but it's a little bit brushed over. We don't hear a ton about it. I certainly didn't learn a lot about it in school. Maybe it was a page or a chapter, no. uh, but not, not very much. And so I wanted to learn more about that time period. Whenever I do go home, I go with my family for drives out in the country and end up in these wonderful little communities, some of which are ghost towns. And some where just a few people are remaining and often they have oral histories and little interpretive printouts that they've made themselves and that they've put in the, the old schoolhouses, the churches, the community buildings. And I learned a lot about the Depression th through those little mini exhibits too. And the more I read and the more I learned, I realized, especially the end of the Depression for Canada, was such a, a tense period of time. There was this east-west divide going on in the country where the, there still you know, is. There's, exactly, <laughs> yeah. there still is. And that's what interested me. Much of what went on in the 30s, we're seeing again 100 years later right now. Uh, we're seeing these repetitions. But there was that divide. And Prime Minister William Lyon Mackenzie King said, oh, the Depression's done. It's over. But out west, a lot of people were still suffering. It wasn't over at all. So that interested me. And the more I read, I, I also came across the royal tour. And I thought, well, that's even more strange that the country had been going through this terrible decade and people had nothing. They had no food. There were no jobs, couldn't keep their homes. And then this extravagant tour is launched. And I didn't know about it. There was very little on the subject. There's one book, I think, and then a 
an or a local historian also published something that was very helpful. Uh, but I thought, what is what strange timing for the king and queen to come to Canada when the country has had a very tough, tough time. And as you mentioned, Canada is still, as it was then, it is still very much conflicted when it comes to our relationship with the, the crown, with the British monarchy. It's, oh, it's There's this tension. It's a love-hate relationship, this desire to, to separate that many are feeling more and more today, and uh, who still have this love and this fascination with the royal family that was in the 30s, and it is still going on now. So that interested me as well, and that is why I, I decided to focus on that one moment in May of 39, just before the war and when the king and queen came through. Sounds absolutely fascinating and right up my street. I love the title, This Bright Dust, but what's bright about the dust? If you if it's not a <laughs> spoiler to expound upon that. Yeah, of course. It alludes to the, the strength and the will of the the characters in the story, the way that they see things, their life and their landscape and the horrible storms, of course, that are coming physically and destroying everything, the, the dust storms. But they choose not to give up and not to be defeated by these external forces. It's an allusion to to their strength of character and how they how they try very desperately to find the beauty in these uh, terrible circumstances. And it's also a reference to when you read about the dust bowl and the storms, and even, you know, storms we are having today, again, there's this parallel uh, to the environmental disasters that are happening then and now. Uh, but when I read many firsthand accounts of these, of these great storms, what fascinated me was the way that people refer to a certain type of light within that that darkness that was coming for them, really, that these skies filled with dust could also be infused with with light as well. So how something terrible and destructive and horrible can also contain uh, an element of beauty. I can't wait to read this now. You have referred, and your the promotional material refers to it as being set on the Canadian prairies. Is there a reason that the province is not specified? I'm guessing it's Alberta, based on your biography and the reference to the Rockies, but I'm just curious about that. It is. It's The town of Grayley is, is pure fiction. It does not exist, but I, I can't remember. I'm, there may be one reference to Alberta in the story itself, but possibly not. Uh, it's more general because when I was reading about the depression and about what different communities were going through in Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, it was a combination of all of these stories that I uh, was thinking of when I wrote the scenes and the characters and the what was happening in the in that landscape. Well, it sounds it sounds so interesting. So you're also a Poet, you have a work of poetry coming out next year. Tell us about it and and, and when in next year is it coming out, if you know. Sure. Yes, uh, I'll have a collection. I believe it's it will be out in April. It's called The Great Wake, and those are poems about really just the everyday what I experience in my neighborhood and in my community, and just uh, daily observations. My Poetry tends to be a little confessional in nature. <laughs> I hope it goes beyond that to some <laughs> more meaningful uh, reflections. In the past, my my collections tended to be one narrative thread, so a, a book of poetry that told a story. But these ones are, are individual standalone poems, a collection of about 80 poems or so. So if your previous collections of poetry have had a narrative arc to them how do you decide what when you get the a whiff of story or inspiration whether it should be a cycle of poetry or a, or a work of fiction or a work of prose fiction good question how does that work, does that work in your in your big brain and uh, soul 
I never know what it will be until I sit and begin to, to write it and the character or the story is there. And then I just try to just do kind of a, a free fall and do kind of like a everything but the kitchen sink approach where I just, you know, get it down and don't think too much about it and don't try to figure out what form it will take uh, in the beginning, at least. And then usually that kind of reveals itself to you as you begin writing. For me, often after finishing a novel, I feel it, I like to take a break and, and then write poems and just, I find that refreshing. Often I need to switch. I like to switch forms in between projects. So. And I'm just so curious to ask if, has it ever happened where you, you said eventually the form kind of reveals itself to you. And so you raise, oh, this is a poem or, oh, this is a novel. Have you ever had a further revelation, a, a ways more into it where you realize, oh, no, this is actually not a poem. I, sh I need to change this into a novel or vice versa. Does that ever happen? That ha hasn't happened uh, yet, but I've had a lot of false starts or just getting through an entire process of writing something completely and then getting to the end and realizing, no, this didn't work out the way I wanted it to. Um, but usually once I start and I, I know the which form it will take fairly, fairly quickly. And then I just try to run with it and not look back. For me, that's the one main thing is just when you're beginning a project and when you're in the initial draft or the first stages, don't look back because if you do, you'll start to analyze too much and you will start to edit and delete things out. And they, they say that perfectionism is the enemy of creativity. And I believe that definitely when you're working on a first draft, I think just to, at least for me, I always try to just plow through and have something concrete to then work with and rework and rework and rework. I forget who who put it into some kind of a writer's manual give yourself permission to write shitty first drafts yes absolutely the shitty first draft is essential yes um, but please don't publish it <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> Anne Lamott talks about that in Bird by Bird I think it was Anne Lamott. brilliant yeah. book yes yeah. absolutely mm -hmm. so I'd like to hear about Nina the Reader you have some books to recommend I do. Yes, I chose two books. And the first one is The Diving Bell and the Butterfly. Oh, yes. Jean-Dominique Bobby. And this this is a translation. The original is uh, was written in French. And I'll, I'm going to read that next. Translated by Jeremy Leggett. I'm a little embarrassed that I had never read this before because it was published originally in the 90s, I think 96 or 97. And I it became, a, I think, an overnight sensation and I had he heard about it. But the scenario, I think at the time when I heard about it was so horrific that I thought I can't read something about that. And now that I've, I have read it, I know that it's a book that I will reread and reread for its, its absolute beauty and it's just it's extraordinary so it's a memoir very short the translation is not 140 pages Jean-Dominique Bobby was the editor-in-chief of Elle magazine in Paris he was in his mid-40s and he one day started feeling strange she suffered a massive stroke was in a coma for close to three weeks. And when he came out of this coma, he had locked in syndrome. And so that is when you are completely, completely paralyzed from head to toe. All he could do was blink his left eye and he could slightly turn his head left or right. His right eye, they ended up having to sew shut because of infection. So this was literally all he could do uh, when he came out of the coma. And he wrote a book. He wrote his memoir, which is absolutely extraordinary. He did it by blinking his left eye and working with someone who assisted him with an alphabet where the letters were placed not in our usual alphabetical order, but in place of frequency of use. So letter by letter, 
he told his story. And it is, it's unbelievable. Even if it was terribly written, I would think that it's extraordinary that someone was oh, able yeah. to do that. But the, the writing itself is stunning. It's told in very short sections. They're almost like vignettes. They almost read like poems, each one. So it's not necessarily something you'd want to read all the way through at once. It's too, it's too good. The diving bell is the reference to, he, he feels as, as though his body is in a cage. And the butterfly is his spirit and his imagination and where he's able to go with that. Each section tells of, his life before, before the stroke, before he became in this situation. Uh, there are scenes in the hospital, which is a hospital by the sea where he is. And then eventually his acceptance of the situation that he's in. And the more he accepts it toward the end, the more his imagination kind of soars. And he writes these beautiful, beautiful scenes. There's a lot of humor as well, which is extraordinary. And it's, uh, of course, very touching. So I would recommend this to everyone. I knew about it and had forgotten everything I'd ever heard about it. So I'm really glad you've reminded me of it. It yeah. reminds me of a memoir that I studied in grad school. I took a graduate course in autobiography and memoir. And we read, I Raise My Eyes to Say Yes by Ruth Senkiewicz Mercer. And very similarly, she... The only communication she had was to raise her eye, and she oh dictated her memoir um, to I look for that one. I haven't heard. Yeah, Incredible. I don't remember it being as literarily as poetic and so on as you're describing, but it was certainly very powerful. Yeah. Oh, I'll look for it. I'll read it as well. And that, that's what's wonderful as well is that it's it's uplifting. It's not depressing. It's not heavy. It's not. Right. And despite what he's gone through, the way that he writes is just, yeah. It's... So that was my one recommendation. Uh, right. And the other is a collection of poems, Turn Up the Ocean by Tony Hoagland. Yeah, he's an American poet, and he's one of my favorites. He had seven or eight collections of poetry. This was his last one. He's one of those few poets who's critically acclaimed and revered, but who writes in a way that is accessible to everyone, to all readers. So anyone who isn't into poetry or who doesn't read poetry, I would challenge you to say that you don't like poetry after you read Tony Hoagland because he's... Challenge he's accepted. Yeah, yeah, I'm one of those. I, I struggle with poetry, but... Oh, uh, I, give it... Give it a try. His poems are confessional in nature. There are also a lot of social commentary in there. You know, he gets at really the the awfulness of human nature, but also the absurdity of the human condition and the wonderful elements as well of of life, the good and the bad. His poems have lots of humor. They're very sad. Toward the end of this collection, I I always get choked up. He passed away of cancer in his mid 60s. So it was his, these were his last poems and his wife actually put them together and the book came out after he had, he had passed away. But rather than go on and on about Tony Hoagland, I thought I could read one of his poems if oh, that's okay. Yeah, absolutely. Is that all right? Okay. Yes. I'll read the title poem of the collection, Turn Up the Ocean. Turn up the ocean. Now that I've bought a machine that plays noises recorded from nature, I can have thunderstorm or forest pines or sonorous ocean at the push of a button. It soothes me in the night to hear the waves sweeping over the beach again and again and the blue-gray background screech of the gulls. It turns out this sound is all the comfort I ever wanted and that all the conversation I really need is that surging of surf played on a permanent loop. Who knew the ocean could be kept on a digital chip along with morning bird song and wind through summer grass? Again and again, my heart has been broken by people who didn't have what I want, whom I then accused of refusing to give me all that they had when their only fault I now see was not being the trees or the wind or the rain, which are only generous because they have an endless supply of everything. Their crime was not being everything, those people, 
which it turns out was my crime too. Now when I hear myself complaining, I can say, this pattern of mine has a certain repetition, which, who knows, someday might even seem natural. In the meantime, I'm going to rely on the great outdoors, which I keep in my little room where I'm going to turn up the ocean. So that's Tony Hoagland. That was lovely. He's amazing. Well, thank you for sharing. Nina, it's been a delight getting acquainted, and I'm looking forward to reading this bright dust and having you back for a long, deep dive kind of chat later on. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sean. It's been wonderful chatting with you. This bright dust really does sound like a Sean book. Can't wait to read it. I say that about all the lovely writers that I have on my mystery guest chat, which means my 2025 reading dance card is uh, pretty much full. But uh, that's a happy problem. This sounds really interesting. I got one video up this week since my last Friday reads. And it was a big one, so it took the whole week to edit. And what a great video it is. It's Lindy of Lindy's Magpie Reads and I interviewed Douglas Bruton about his third most recent novel, blue postcards we had a great chat with him and i think you will enjoy it and i think you're gonna after you watch it you're gonna want to rush right out and get the book and read it there's a there's a kind of sorcery and i asked douglas point blank and kind of in a silly manner how he achieves this sorcery but there is a sorcery that he wields in his fiction that just transfixes yours truly and i think you might too be bewitched by it. So check out Douglas Bruton. And I think Blue Postcards would be a great place to start, but really any of them. All right, it's the story of my Friday Reads, where I always say, well, I was hoping to finish more, and I didn't quite finish them, and that's true again this week, so blah, blah, blah. But I have finished one, and that was the audiobook that I was doing for Spinster September. And it ended up being a bit of a dud, a novel or novella by Mona Simpson, the American writer, I say this every time I mention her name, a biological sibling of Steve Jobs, and it was called Off Keck Road. Now, 176 pages published in the year 2000, and I was really quite underwhelmed. I'm probably not going to try Mona Simpson again unless one of you tells me that there's one out there that I, I should try, but uh, this fell quite flat. It held my interest, so I didn't bail, but I was disappointed by the character work. The way I would describe it is, you know how when you read a really good magazine article that has people in it that are described by the magazine writer, and I'm talking about a non-fiction article, it's not the same as literary fiction that goes really deep into character. It's still admirable, and you kind of get a little ways into the character and understanding the character and uh, some of you are probably going to come at me and tell me I need to read this nonfiction book or that nonfiction book or article to realize that, yes, in a nonfiction account, you can capture character and render character as deeply as in literary fiction. But uh, I remain unconvinced of that. And that's how I would describe the character work in Off Keck Road. Uh, it just didn't go deep enough. Um, it had a lot of potential that it didn't realize, is what I would say. And there was a, three women. Uh, one of them was so boring that I, I don't remember if she did get married, but she seemed to be a spinster. Uh, spinster doesn't, it's set in the Wisconsin in the 1970s. Spinster isn't really the, the term that would be used, but certainly an uh, unmarried uh, woman. Shelley, I don't think she was ever married. But the main unmarried woman, quote-unquote spinster, was B who became a real estate agent and I would say it showed those characters as still really depending on having a man that they could pine over, be romantically and or sexually involved with, and a wistfulness and a sense of loss that they never settled down or got conventionally partnered or married. So not particularly a literary role model for spinster fiction. Interesting to a certain degree, but disappointingly superficial, I would say. So that's enough about that. I am ready to check in on two books, one of which you don't even know that I've started, but I'll start with the one 
that I did mention last week, and that is The Art Lover by Carol Meso. And this is for the really great reading challenge or readathon that's being put on by Lindy and a bunch of other fabulous booktubers framed in September. And this is one of the books, I think probably the only book I'm going to read for it. And by the way, the, the video that I mentioned with the interview with Douglas Bruton, that book is so much about art that that would be an excellent pick for Framed in September. This one is starting out promisingly. This feels dated in a way that I feel dated. It's set in the 80s, I think. It's published in 1990. And it's about a woman going back home when her father dies. It appears that he might be the last family member left, but I'm not far enough into it to really know that. We're in lots of scenes of her childhood and her sister's childhood, although I'm not even clear yet uh, by page 27 who the main character is, who the, which daughter is the main character. I think I know, but I'm not entirely sure. But the father was an artist and art history prof, I think. And he has died a little bit young, but elderly, like maybe 65 or something, 70. The mother, I think, took her own life when the kids were young. That's all I can tell about the plot, but the writing is lovely. The descriptions are lush, vivid, and there hasn't been a whole bunch about art yet, but I expect there's going to be more and more. I have a good feeling about it. All of which is to say, for the moment, I'm optimistic that this is going to be a hit. The other one that I've started that I didn't tell you about, because I don't think I knew I was going to be starting it, but because I finished that audiobook, I have this book on audio, and I, and I ordered a library copy because I knew I'd probably want to either do it as a combo or have at least have the book to, to refer to if I was out walking around and I missed a key passage and wanted to review it. And that is a book that's on the Booker Long List. My God, I'm so with it, hip, plugged into the moment, the literary moment, <laughs> reading a Booker Long Listed book. The Safe Keep by Jal van der Wooden, and I... It was pronounced correctly on the audiobook. Let's see if I can get, because uh, I know that that's not it's how it's pronounced. Let's look it up. Well, it's pretty I'm difficult not. to pronounce. Oh, my goodness. Um, I'm finding it impossible to pronounce. So here is her saying her own name. I can't get it. It's, here, here it is. I'm Yael van der Wouden. I'm the author of The Safe Keep. I'm Yael van der Wouden. I'm the author of... Yalfen Vauden, so it's, uh, the uh, der is not pronounced, if I'm hearing it correctly, so there, it's the best, uh, from now on, if I'm having trouble pronouncing an author's name, and I can find video or audio of them pronouncing their own name, that is how I will skirt that pronunciation challenge. Anyway, I'm not very far into it, but I'm far enough into it to tell you that I'm really enthusiastic about it. It is starting out fantastic, so I'm doing it as an audio text combo. The audio narration is great. I've only read the first chapter, and I don't usually check in that early, but it's set in 1961 in a countryside Dutch province, and there are three siblings so far. The daughter lives in the house that they, they all grew up in with their parents, and she's about 30, and she has an older brother, I think, and a younger brother. I think I've got that right, and they don't live there, but they live nearby, and... They have a typical sibling relationship. There are conflicts and arguments and disagreements and disapproval and all that, as well as other more positive emotions. And I'm not saying anything very specific about it. I would just say it's just a joy to read already because of the rich characterization, the vividness of the descriptions, and none of them are married. I think one of them might be gay. He has a male roommate, and that's as far as I've got with that. But... Isabel is my favorite character so far, and she's a little prickly, and like I say, she's about 30, and they're going out for dinner, and the other brother always brings a date to their get-togethers, and it's a different girl every time. He even brought a date to their mother's funeral. <laughs> Can you imagine? And sure enough, he brings a floozy, and I'm sorry to use that word, but that's what she is... <laughs> That's how Isabel uh, experiences her and how the reader does. And it's just a fact, like, it, that sounds so ordinary, doesn't it? But no, it's not. It's really, really engaging. And the other thing is that actually the, 
really, the, the opening really is that Isabel is digging in the garden and she found a, some broken pieces of ceramic, the dish set that her mother had that, that she still has in the house and she has the complete set. So what is this broken from? D what happened? D did some servant screw up and try to hide the evidence? But there's still a complete set. And her brother H Hendrik reminds her that this set of dishes was already in the house when her, their parents bought it. So whatever this mystery is with the ceramic pieces that's bothering Isabel so much, she gets really bothered by things and, and kind of a little bit maybe obsessive compulsive obsessive about things but he says for goodness sakes these dishes were in the house so who knows what this was all about and i don't know if that's going to become anything in the novel and i don't want you to tell me but all of that has already beguiled me so um looking forward to continuing with this all right so i don't need to keep everything a surprise from you i got lots of surprises up my sleeve in the coming weeks and months but I'm not going to keep this one a surprise. I'll tell you what, I, what I'm doing. Next month, I am interviewing two of my favorite Irish writers who have been on my channel umpteen times about their latest novels. One is Covery Madavan about her novel, The Inheritance, which I don't think it's actually out yet. So I have a, an arc. She sent me an arc. And Ronan Hessian's third novel, Ghost Mountain. I can't remember how many novels The Inheritance is. Covery, maybe fourth? And Ronan sent me this. This has been out for a few months and getting rave reviews. And so I'm going to read them both. And then, actually, I'm just going to kind of hold the Zoom space for them to chat with each other about their novels. I will interview them a little bit, but really, they're, I'm just going to stand back and let them talk to each other, and that'll be wonderful. So that's coming up in mid-October, so I've got my reading cut out for me. Hopefully, I will finish two other books that I'm, you know, at the, about the halfway mark before I get started on these, but probably not. In terms of keeping my book current reads down to 15, uh, it's uh, progress, not perfection. And let's leave it at that. <laughs> anyway, uh, all of these problems that I'm alluding to are just fabulous bookish problems to have. So I hope you're having lots of fabulous bookish problems in your life. And uh, I'd love to hear about them in the comment section below. I'm doing a lot better with keeping up with comments. On a New Year's resolution, very belatedly um, uh, operationalized. Thanks for watching. <laughs> <laughs>